Okay. Thank you. Okay. See it. Wow. Um, I'm really humble with all the people that are here. Um, I'm all my friends, new and old, and uh, thank you so much for coming. It's really great to be able to see you in one manner or another, especially through these difficult times. So um, I figure we can use a little enjoyment to get through this everywhere we can get it. So I get mine through aloes and um, it looks like maybe you do too. So, um, so my talk is called Aloes on My Mind, Exploring Aloe Hybrids One Generation at a Time. Uh, this is a short overview of my talk. It's, uh, I'm going to talk about the range of diversity among aloe species, aloe hybridizers, getting started, some of my first attempts, results I liked, and some I didn't, of course, yay or nay, only time will tell, and then future possibilities. So Luther Burbank once said something that's always really resonated with me. The secret of improved plant breeding, aside from scientific knowledge, is love. And I absolutely agree with that. This is my happy obsession. I love my job. I'm so lucky I get to work at the Huntington and I take care of thousands and thousands of succulents. Um, and I'm really lucky that my boss supports me in my hobby of hybridizing aloes. Um, that's just been really fun. So let's look at some aloes. Of course, aloe barbadensis, aloe vera, everybody knows it. It's in a million products. Um, I'm always surprised how many people come to our sales and uh, think that all aloes are some form of aloe vera. So it's a, definitely an opportunity for education. There are at this point over 600 species. So there's a lot to choose from. Uh, and they're not all medicinal, so it's also good to tell people some can actually be toxic. Um, aloes grow naturally in much of sub-Saharan Africa, in Madagascar, the Arabian Peninsula, as well as several islands in the Indian Ocean. So let's explore a few from our aloe palette, of course, for hybrids. Um, there's many ways you can characterize aloes. They, they're huge range. So we'll start with size and we'll start with the smallest, some of the smallest ones. Aloe discoinsii variety Augustina. That's been used in a lot of hybrids over the years. It's, it's adorable. It's diminutive. Um, it forms a really nice, beautiful, tight clump after a while. This is Aloe carcarophylla. And this one also stays very small and it's got some kind of cool teeth. It's not very colorful, but it's cool. A little bit larger, this is Crepoliana. Really big flowers for its size. Um, aloes also can be shrubby, such as aloe arborescens, which makes a beautiful winter display. This is in the desert garden at the Huntington. And it's always a popular site in the winter when all these go into flower. And aloes can be as large as trees. Um, aloe Susanne, this one doesn't have a trunk yet. Uh, one of my favorites, aloe dichotoma, this beautiful fissured bark, all the way up to aloe barbare, can get 40, 50 feet tall. Um, you also have different differences in the way they grow and the way they survive in their environment. So some of them are cliffhangers, um, some of them are sprawlers along the ground. I put some, a few rarer ones because they're fun to look at. Aloe whitcomi, which is a cliffhanger. Beautiful little aloe. Aloe mera, you can see how beautiful this is. And thank Kelly for this photograph, uh, growing out of a crack in a vertical rock face. Aloe Castelloniae. This one hasn't been in collections for too long yet, for too many years, but obviously very popular. It's a gorgeous little thing, with great teeth, forms nice chains of recurved leaves. And you can also choose aloes by their leaf arrangements. Aloe polyphylla that can go clockwise or counterclockwise, the spiral aloe is a gorgeous species. 
Uh, there are a couple that stay disticus or fan shaped, like Compressa variety Rugo squamosa, and also Plicatilis. And of course, what I really like teeth, prickles, pustules, whatever you want to call them, on those leaves. Alloparvula, which is a beautiful little species, and you can see all the little uh, teeth and stuff, on, not just on the margins, but on the surface of the leaf. Allodivericata, which is a small tree. And both of these species are used in a lot of hybrids, especially early on. Alloaranacea. This one um, is really a gorgeous one, and those, te those teeth are very needle-life, very stiff, and will go right into your finger. Uh, Allo humulus is a really nice little clumping shrubby or a very short one, really good in landscapes and they've got beautiful flowers. So we can also look at colors too. Aloes come in many colors. Allodorothea is one of my favorite species. It's got this beautiful glossy hard leaves. Um, even when they're not stressed out from heat, cold, drought, um, and they're a chartreuse you know, happy, having a very luxurious life, they're still beautiful. But they can get a beautiful red, as well as Cameronia gets a very nice red in stress too. Um, so we have all these different species, but um, you also have varieties within a species. And these two pictures that Kelly sent me of Urethrophila, this one, you can see the colors, you can see the little, little bumps on the surface of the leaf. But then look at this population. It's completely different. So black. I would love pollen from either one of those to play with. Then you go to the other end of the spectrum, the ghostly waxy white types, the Ruslii. We've got the Capitatas. This is variety Quartzeticola. How about pinstripes? Allo bargalensis as well as Caris bargensis to have these beautiful lines on the leaves. You can get some, of course, there's a lot of spotty aloes. I, I went with the rarer aloe citrina that also has hairy flowers, which is a plus. Elevoxii, got stripes and spots. And this one hasn't been described for too many years now, Montes Nabro, which is a beautiful elongate diamond shaped spots on the leaves and these beautiful wavy leaf structure. It's a beautiful species. So it's like, where do you even start? Fortunately, we stand on very broad shoulders in this area. And there've been a lot of people over the years that have bred aloe hybrids. And I, I grouped them into two groups. Um, the type more uh, bred for landscapes and for flower production. And you can see the list of people that I highly admire, including our very own William Hartrick of the Huntington, the first superintendent of the gardens, and actually the man that responsible for creating the desert garden. And fantasy aloes, small collectibles that are more for the foliage than the flowers. And this is a, a list of respected hybridizers of this type of aloe as well. I always like to give a special shout out to Kelly. Um, he started me on this path. <laughs> um, I, I was not an aloe hybrid fan really in the beginning. I loved species, but he donated some of his early hybrids to our succulent symposium auction and as, as well to our desert collections. And I, I was just absolutely in awe of the colors and textures he had, even in his early hybrids. They were so amazing. And I thought, oh my God, this looks like so much fun. And of course, anyone who knows Kelly, he's very excited, he's very passionate. And so it was very infectious. I was like, oh my God, this looks like fun. I want to try it. But I kind of felt like I didn't know if there was something like plant plagiarism uh, I f it felt like cheating to take his hybrids and breed with them. Like I was, you know, not starting with my own. 
So I called him and asked him for permission to use his hybrids to play with. And he was so supportive. And he said, just, if you have any questions, or you need help, whatever, um, you can always call me and please let me know what you come up with. So super supportive. And of course he laughed at me with the whole plant plagiarism, but I, you know, I just felt like it was cheating. So anyway, let's look at some stuff I started with. This was in early 2000, probably 2001 or 2002. So first, of course, you've got to start with some flowers. And these two, you can see aloes are super easy to hybridize. Usually the, all the sexual parts are right out there, usually extend beyond the, the tip of the petals. And of course, you've got your female stigma right here. And then you've got your male anthers here. They're already dehissing some pollen. So that's a good start. Um, I wanted to show you some of my trusty tools that I like to use. My finger, of course, I use the most. I never lose them. There are, I have many of them. And so I can do different crosses with different fingers if I want. Um, tweezers are also a really good tool. You can take, just detach an anther and dab it right on the stigma of other flowers. Um, or if you have bigger pollinating jobs that you want to do a lot of flowers, you can use, you know, one of these small soft paint brushes. Um, pencil is probably my second favorite. I use that a lot. I moisten the tip and that helps hold the pollen really well. Um, and then, of course, we have cat whiskers, which I, I just put it in there for fun. It's actually a very good pollinating tool for things like pacopodiums and things. Um, not not so useful for aloes, but I, I like to throw it in just because it's funny. Um, please do it with mutual consent from your cat, though. Uh, this is another tool that's really good. It's a dental kind of tool. I got this from my mom, actually. It's amazing how many oral hygiene and kitchen items are good horticultural tools. Um, but this holds pollen really well with this little rubbery tip with the little ribs on it. It's got a little handle. It's perfect. You may also want to use pollination tags if you want to keep track of what your parents are. Um, and we put the seed parent first, the pollen parent, um, how many flowers I did, the date, and then the placement of the tag, which would be over the top flower so that I know anything that I pollinated with below that tag is that cross. If you're really excited, uh, that one of your plants is flowering for the first time. You may have one that looks like this too, where you have to pollinate it with everything. So with all that work and time you're putting in, you don't want to lose the seeds. Of course, aloes have dry capsules. So once they start opening up, then you're going to lose the seed if you don't find some way to catch them uh, or if you're not watching them all the time. So um, with single capsules, I have used scotch tape before. Uh, also for larger batches, I'll use maybe nylons, if you can find nylons anymore. I don't know any, why anyone would want to wear them, but, um, but those actually are really nice. They're stretchy. You can put them over the inflorescence and tie it off on the bottom. But this is my new favorite tool. Uh, these little mesh drawstring gift bags are fantastic. Uh, they come in different sizes. They're super easy to just put over your seed capsules and then pull the strings and it just stays right on there. And they look pretty too. So you can see that the capsules are starting to split open. And there are those little dry seeds. I'm hoping some people will actually be encouraged to do this. I think seed sowing is the best thing with plants. It's just an amazing, amazing feeling to grow things from seed, whether it's vegetables, aloes, it doesn't matter what. Um, so you can see that we use mostly pumice, so it's 80% pumice, pumice and 20% organic. And you can see I put the seeds on there. We use like a quartz grit on top just to hold the seeds in place as well as um, control a little bit of the algae that might build up with the moisture. If you don't have a greenhouse or something to use, the Ziploc baggie method works really good. Just soak your pot, put it in a Ziploc bag and, and seal it. Put it in a bright light, but not full sun, of course. And, you know, it becomes a little greenhouse. And of course, the hardest part, just waiting. 
And I find that usually takes about two weeks. And then you see this little monocot, little cotyledons, that first leaf that comes up. It's always exciting uh, when the first true leaf comes up and it's already got a little character, you know, maybe a little, little color, little bigger teeth. Super exciting. You know, you want your rewards where you can get them as soon as you can. Okay, so I'm going to show you some of my first attempts. This was a long time ago. Uh, I took Kelly's dental work and I crossed it with an old classic hybrid, Doran Black, a Dick Wright hybrid. And I got one I dubbed Livewire because almost every single inflorescence has this little plant that grows on it, little bulbul. Um, and, the, you know, the plant itself isn't that pretty. It's not prettier than either, either parent, really, in my opinion. But it is kind of a nice contrast with the color and the little plantlets are, have a lot more teeth. So they look cool. And they stay on there for a long time. So these are still attached. And then those will flower and those will create a little plantlet. That's well, kind of fun. So I also crossed dental work with another Dick Wright hybrid called Frank Renelt. And I got one I call Confetti, which I've never released. Um, I still really like it, but I don't know. I keep going back and forth. Um, it's probably not that great anymore, but it does get good color. It gets kind of a purpley background. Uh, and in brighter light, it gets even more orange in the teeth. So I still like that one but I like all my kids. Um, so about this time I thought, well, I, maybe it's time to kind of reinvent the wheel and go back to species to species. Even though I decided to use two that are used in a lot of hybrids, I wanted to, um, you don't want to just keep re-pollinating um, the same hybrids of other people all the time without taking, trying to take it in a different direction. It'll always produce different results to a point but um, so anyway, I went back, I, I just decided it would be fun. And I think part of it was I wanted to feel like a real hybridizer, like start from species and then work uh, complicating the generations after that. So I took Divericata and I took Parvula and I came up with a seed batch that I just kind of dubbed KZ number one. And then I put clone numbers for each one. And so the first two to flower was clone one and clone two. The best clones of that batch were clone one and clone five, but five decided not to flower that year. And I was like, oh, I really wanted to do the two prettiest ones. But these two were flowering and I was very excited. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna cross these. As it turns out, I got two named hybrids out of this one, this cross. Later, I did the two pretty ones and I ended up throwing away all the seedlings. They were terrible. So you never know, sometimes the parents aren't that attractive. So this was the first one that uh, we actually named and distributed, uh, Allo Dragons for my nephew. And it gets pretty large, like a foot and a half, I think it can get tall. Got nice teeth. Um, I was pretty excited about it. it was, um, this is the back of the leaf and I did think it looked kind of like dragon scales. This is the other one, Aloe Princess Jack. This one came out the following year in 2011. And this was for my niece, Lindsay. <laughs> Princess Jack, I know, don't even ask. But more pastel colors, a uh, little wider leaves and teeth. But it, it looks kind of more feminine in a toothy way. Very waxy leaves. Okay, so now I'm going to show you, here's two generations. So we've got the dental work and Frank Renault that created confetti. We've got Divericata and Parvula that created KZ number one. And I crossed these two together just to show you how they change by de uh, generation. And I got Allo DZ, which was by far my best one at that time. And I don't know, it's one of my favorites still. This one came out in 2010. Gets really good color, lots of really cool teeth. Um, I was super excited about it.
This was another one that came out in 2010, and this was uh, one of Kelly's unnamed KG number five, and I crossed it with Nathan Wong's Amako Amano, and I got Aloe Gargoyle. This one came out in 2010. And it's got more of the uh, compound teeth, the kind of orangey and, and brown colors. It, it can color up real nice in the sun. It can also get kind of green, but it keeps those orange teeth. This is a sister plant. This one's Brown Betty and the same cross. This one's a lot smoother. Uh, it gets really nice and brown with those white. When it gets a little bit green in lower light and um, also when it's growing, but uh, I love that brown color. And it's also, actually I've been putting them in hanging baskets. They've got nice recurved teeth, I mean te uh, leaves, and it forms a very nice clump. You know, it's not messy. This is Aloe Chameleon. This one came out in 2013. And this was KG number five, and I crossed it with an old Dick Wright hybrid called Paul Hutchison. And as the seasons change and it starts to go dormant in the summer, it starts to blush up, which is kind of why I called it Chameleon. And that's what it looks like in the winter. But the thing I love most about it, and it really translates well into its progeny and its babies, is this um, kind of hazy, foggy um, pattern, white pattern that goes through the back of the leaf. I thought this picture was out of focus and I thought I wasn't going to be able to use it, but it's just that it's hard to focus on it because of that haze. So I think it's, I love that about that one. This is Aloe Oik. This one came out in 2013 and this was confetti and I crossed it to KZ number one. And you can see the teeth are getting really crazy on it. It gets really good color. Um, when it gets thirsty, I let it get thirsty so you can see that it kind of folds up like little taco shells. And then I, I watered it, don't worry. Uh, but the teeth are getting super awesome. I love this kind of thing. But what I love most about this one is that every leaf is a little bit different. It looks like kind of a medieval weapon with blades and daggers and stuff on it. Really cool. This one's Aloe Marsha Lehu, and Marsha is in the room too. <laughs> um, this is one that I actually like better in lower light because I like the contrast of the warm colors and the cool colors of the leaf. Uh, but she'll blush up really nicely. I've seen um, pictures online of people that have it, that grow it in different situations, and it gets really good color. And you can see some of the teeth. This one is Jeff Karsner, and I named this for my friend Jeff. He started out as a volunteer for me at the Huntington and worked his way up to becoming head gardener of the Children's Garden. And unfortunately in 2013, he had a really tragic accident and passed away. Uh, so I wanted to do an aloe for him and for his family. So this is aloe Jeff Karsner. It gets really good color. This one is not named, but I liked it because it's starting to get a little bit longer teeth and kind of, um, I don't know, I, I wasn't sure what I was going for, but I know longer teeth was one of the things. So I thought, well, I'll use it in breeding. I, I wasn't really that pleased with the rest of the look of it, except for the teeth. I thought that was a cool thing that I could breed from. So you can see it's starting to get complicated, as complicated as uh, dental work already was, um, Wonderkind, all, all these other things that already had a lot of uh, generations in them. But to put it on a tag is really hard. And I admit I've gotten lazy now. I, I just do it the way the hummingbirds and the bees do it. I don't, I don't leave any paper trail. <laughs> um, so, but this is, I just wanted to show you without pictures what um, each of these parents looks like how, much, how many different plants are in there already. And that uh, created Aloe Wiley Coyote. This one, I am crazy about it. I, um, that came out in 2016. It almost looks more like a Hectia or something than it does an Aloe. And it just gets these really a crazy teeth. Not super colorful otherwise necessarily. One of my favorite things about it is that it doesn't have a straight 
leaf margin because the teeth just sort of bite in, forgive the pun, uh, into the margin of the leaf. So I really, it's a really good one, I think. This one is aloe corduroy. And, you know, I grew up in the 70s and Levi's corduroys were a huge thing then. And I, when I saw this one growing up, I was like, oh, this looks just like corduroy. So hence the name. This one came out in 2017. It was probably my least popular hybrid. Um, and I, I don't think it would have been if I'd known that it actually colors up amazingly outside or with some stress. Um, here's just a close up of the leaf all those teeth on the surface. But this is what it does outside. I didn't even know that. I had made this sun bowl for my mom and brought it home after she passed. And um, it just had these amazing colors, golds, peaches. I had no idea. So there you go. This one really blew my mind when it was a baby, tiny baby. This is in a two inch pot and just the teeth and everything on it were super amazing to me. And this one I called Secret Agent. The color, the teeth, uh, it was really, I was so excited about it. And it went through a ugly period where it, the teeth were starting to dry up and turn brown and I just thought, oh well you know, back to the drawing board. But then Tim told me, Tim Harvey, he said, pot it up, it's just pot bound. So I was like, oh yeah, because these teeth actually need hydration too. So if it's thirsty, then it's gonna of course sacrifice the least important part of itself, which would be the teeth. So I potted it up and lo and behold, it became beautiful again. Well, interesting and cool again. Um, so it actually came out in um, 2018, I think. But that's, yeah, I really like that one. Crazy teeth. This one, uh, I really like. It's a lot plainer, but the teeth are amazing on it. And what I love the best about it is that the teeth, especially at the base of the leaf, recurve back behind the leaf. I thought that was really cool. I hadn't seen that before. I thought that was worthy. So that is sawbones. And it can color up like this too if it stresses a little bit. But it's got some really good teeth on it. And that came out in 2018 as well. This is, um, all of my hybrids go through tissue cultures. Of course, everybody does this now. It takes forever to do it vegetatively. I'd still be cutting up my first hybrid probably if we didn't have tissue culture. So this is uh, sawbones just out of tissue color. Cash, huh, tissue culture, excuse me. This one is the newest one to the family. This is barnacle and it's not the most colorful one. And the pictures I have here show it, the teeth a lot more colorful than it usually is. So I apologize for that. But what I love about it is it's diminutive size. It's very stocky, but small. And I love the way that the offsets come out, just burst out between leaves out of the side, almost like a ball. It's really small and compact, so I really like it. And that just came out this year. This is the first one that's ever sold out. So I'm working on getting more of those. Okay, so I'm gonna show you some that are in the works right now. This one, everybody asks me to put this one into production. I, I always resisted because it looks so much like one of the parents, uh, which is compressive variety, Rugo Squamosa. Uh, it's got amazing yellow teeth. It's got really waxy, nice pale leaves. Um, but I thought it looked too much like the species, although it really doesn't because it's a lot more robust. It's larger and it's also going rosulate. So it's not staying in a fan shape. Um, it's, it's pretty nice. Um, so I was, I've been really stuck. I usually have no trouble coming up with names, but I had trouble coming up with this one. Uh, until I found out, I wanted something that had to do with gold or yellow. So I came up with galactic gold, which is the way the universe 
actually creates heavy metals like gold, um, and that is two supernovas colliding. So I thought, well, that's not <laughs> that's not being um, a little bit presumptuous, right? But I thought it was a good name. So this one is now in tissue culture. So I'm hoping for next year. Uh, we'll see how fast it, it grows. This is another one. I'm, I'm waiting for an inflorescence to put that into tissue culture. I don't know why I like this one so much, but it reminds me of a really heavy upholstered something, suitcase or couch or tapestry or something. I don't know, but it, it always draws my eye. So, uh, and I thought it was different than the other ones that I've done. So I'm waiting to put this one into tissue culture too. This is another one I'm waiting for the inflorescence. I really like it. I love how wispy and, and crazy those um, teeth are. It's not super colorful, but I don't even care. I, I really like it. So that one's gonna go in too. Okay, so this one is called yay or nay. And also uh, sometimes it's yay and then nay. So I'll show you some of these. Uh, so I tried crossing Doran Black. This was an old, old one and uh, Wonderkind. Sometimes you do old crosses and they just don't catch your attention until much later. So this was just a few years ago. I, I was like, wait, this one's kind of nice. It's not super colorful, but um, I dubbed it Mama's Doily for my grandmother. She'd given me these hand crocheted doilies um, a long time ago that were hand crocheted by nuns. She got them in I don't remember where she did some world uh, cruise, but, and I'm not a doily kind of girl at all, but I did, I do love old things and interesting things and I love anything my grandmother gave me. So anyway, I thought it kind of looked like an intricate doily. <laughs> so I'm still waiting on that one. I, I'm watching it. Um, I tried doing a cross between chameleon and dragon just to see what would happen. And I did get, this was the only one that interested me at all. Um, it's lost its color now, uh, so it's just kind of fallen off the radar. I did another cross with Brown Betty and a sibling to Dragon and Princess Jack that was just an unnamed clone that I had. And I got two that I liked. Uh, I love this soft kind of chocolate look of this one but it's kind of lost its color a little bit. And then this one I really like. This one I was gonna call Swamp Thing. And I loved how wet it looks and that like really dark olive color. I thought it was super interesting. It looked like something you'd dredge up from a swamp. But this is what it looks like now. Um, not very interesting, not very glossy, uh, just boring. So. Oh well. Uh, this one I'm watching. I love how black the leaves are and it doesn't get too green when it's growing so it stays pretty dark. So I thought well I'll watch it or at least use it in breeding. Uh, this is another cross I tried, Brown Betty and Chameleon. See what would happen. And I got this one which I really really like. I like the yellow teeth. I love the kind of orangey red on the surface of the leaf. It looks really pretty. But, you know, so that looked good then, but this is what it looks like now. Yeah, not very interesting. Uh, so I also cr tried crossing Brown Betty and Gargoyle, which would take it, a, a, since they have the same parents, uh, just be the next generation, just to see what it would bring out in them. And there were two that I liked. I got this one that has more color with kind of broad bands, but the other one that's less colorful, but these bands of, of white were so big and it doesn't really translate on this picture, but just bigger blocks than I'd seen anywhere. And I just thought it was super cool. Unfortunately, you can see on a couple of the leaves, it's already kind of starting to break up in places, but I thought, wow, that's really interesting. So maybe I can do something with that in the future. You know, I'm still watching it and see how it grows. This is an unnamed one too. I love the colors, the that kind of blue green and the pale red. Uh, my favorite thing about it are these really crazy shaped teeth and the way they kind of lay over on each other in the surface of the leaf. So I'm, I'm watching it. 
this one was, I named it Kamikaze and we sold a couple of them at the sales. Uh, and then I kind of pulled it back again. I, it just kind of lost its colors. It got more and more mature. So yeah, sometimes they just lose their oomph. This was another one I really liked. I love the green and the red and that the surface teeth were almost more little blobs than teeth. But that one got really kind of colorless too, just went away. Uh, this one I wanted to call Warlord because it's so glossy and it was so red, it looked like blood. I know it's kind of creepy, but, um, but it was really cool. I was very excited about it. It was very different. But, um, you know, unfortunately now this is what it looks like and it's just a la meh. Just green, it's not glossy, ugly. Sorry, but it's ugly. So I tried, I thought, wow, Marsha Lehu and Oik, two really awesome looking hybrids. They gotta make great kids. And this was the only one that was even at all noteworthy. And most of the time, these bottom leaves are all it did, which was super boring, I thought. But occasionally it throws out these trios of leaves that have way more teeth on them and are super colorful. I mean, really sunset colors. It's really cool. And I, I but now it doesn't really do that. I, I don't know. So yeah, nothing came of that one. This was another one that I really loved for a while. This was, uh, I love the steel blue color of it. It looks like somebody painted it and the teeth are really crazy on the sides, but this is what it looks like now. Just super boring. And a messy clump too. I don't like messy clumpers. This is an unnamed one and it's one that I still sometimes think I wanna name, but it looks very close to Marsha Lehu parts of, some parts of the year. Other times they look really different from each other, but it's got a bluer, smaller dashes on the surface and stuff, but um, it's just, it's probably too close. So, yeah, well. Okay, well, there were a lot of disappointments, but don't lose hope because they may make great parents. So you can still use them for breeding, especially if they've got some characteristics you like. All right, I'm gonna show you some future possibilities now and I've added some uh, since of course this is a little older, uh, some of these guys, but uh, so it's really hard to choose. I I'm telling you, I mean, these are all living things when I have to go through and call the ones that don't make it you know, don't make the grade or just aren't good enough to even breed with, I destroy them. That's something that Kelly always taught me. Don't let a lot of unnamed stuff go get out there. It just mixes things up, you know, with things that maybe they look like and um, it confuses identifying a lot of the hybrids. So, so I always destroy them or I take them home and then uh, kind of experiment to see how much cold they can take, you know, weather outside but it's really hard. <laughs> so this one I added, this is just very new to my watch list. And I, it's not super colorful, but the teeth are so cool. I love the way it's got all these little bunches of different types of teeth and they're all smushed together. So I thought that one was definitely worth watching. This is another one, it's just, there's a few clones that I have that look kind of like this and it's just got lots of teeth, which I really like. So we're watching those. This is another one, it's got really long, some of these are half the length of the whole leaf. And I thought, wow, that would be really cool to get one that had these ridges that would go the entire length of the leaf would be super cool. So it's actually has better color than it shows here too. This is another one that's got lots of short little dashes and teeth and stuff on it. And it's actually a lot oranger than it shows in the picture. For some reason, I couldn't get it to really show the color really nicely. But um, so I'm watching that one. It's really promising to me. This one, I have a couple of different clones in this cross and this was really colorful. It obviously has Secret Agent as one of the parents. And this was only in a two inch pot. This is another clone from that cross and it's a lot greener, but it's got these really cute Dr. Seuss-like teeth. 
This was a different cross and I really like this one. It looks almost like it's got little crab pinchers. I'm watching those. Oh, there's so much fun. And then this one, this one was the most promising yet of secret agent babies, I think. Really good color as a baby. Almost more teeth than leaf surface. It's insane how many teeth this thing has. So that, I was really excited about it. This is what it looks like now. More exciting than Secret Agent? Uh, don't really think so, but I'm going to keep watching it and see what happens. Maybe I'll pot it up too and let it go crazy. So I have a few that have this kind of a characteristic with the solid margin of teeth and the waviness and I thought wow not only would it be cool to get one that's got more curves and the teeth but what if you can get the whole leaf to start doing that that would be really awesome this is one I'm watching as well it's got lots of teeth it still looks pretty good but not as good as it looked here so it, it's not quite off the work, work list yet uh, this one it's a lot more mustard yellow than it looks here. I, I couldn't get the camera just insisted that it had some green in it and certain times of the year it's just this mustard yellow. It's so cool. So I'm definitely watching that to see if it holds it through maturity. This one of course is a lot less uh, toothy and colorful but it's got some pretty crazy wavy teeth on it so I liked it. I'm watching that one too. And this one has also got lots more teeth. Uh, I think it's a sibling to the one that I'm putting into tissue culture because it, it looks kind of similar, doesn't have as many teeth as that one though. But it's good, I really like watching it. And then here's just a few pots of smaller things coming along. You can see how crazy they are with their little teeth or the color. It's so much fun to grow them from seed, you guys. Just some little tiny babies. And of course, one of the things that I've really been wanting to do is to grow things with longer and longer teeth. Uh, these are probably some of the longest yet. And I just thought, how cool would it be to have a hybrid that the teeth get so long that you have, that they get wispy and you have to comb them for a show or something? Is that even possible? So I just want to leave you with the real fun doesn't stop with what you create today. It's imagining what's next. Thank you so very much. Thank you all. And be safe. Everybody be safe out there. Okay. Uh, thank you. All right. So a lot of people have been asking questions uh, uh, all along here. Uh, so if you could put your questions in the Q&A section here and we'll answer them so we don't need to go back and forth between the chat and the Q&A. You can feel, feel free to keep on chatting among yourselves. But let's uh, go through the Q&A uh, questions here. And Karen, if you can look at the Q&A, maybe uh, uh, feel, feel like you want to answer any of those. Just let us know. Irving, you want to help out as well? <laughs> Sure. Karen, uh, an interesting question I saw is, to what effect do micronutrients and light and other conditions affect the color of your aloes? Uh, that's a good question. Micronutrients and stuff? I don't know. I mean, we, we fertilize through the growing season. Uh, we use a Liquinox. Um, but that's basically it. Otherwise, it's a pretty lean mix that we put them in. It's mostly pumice with some organic. Um, of course, light, light, cold, heat, drought, all those can definitely uh, play a part in bringing out temporary color, at least, or, or potential color that that particular hybrid has. Uh, but that's, those are just stresses, you know. So, <laughs> Kelly, how do you really feel? <laughs> I hope that answers that. Okay, um, let me see. You want to look at some of these? Okay, so the questions come up. What is tissue culture? I don't think it's a, <laughs> a, an easy question to answer, but maybe you can just give it a shot. Well, 
Um, I will as a total lay person that doesn't know the science of it too well, but you, you basically, and you can do this from a very young inflorescence or you can take a small offset. Um, you core it down to a cube of tissue and basically you put it in a substrate of agar and um, you manipulate it with hormones and things to create, uh, so you end up with, oh boy, Kelly is listening too and he's, he'd be much better to answer this. Um, but anyways, you, you can create a lot of plants. You can tell them what you want them to develop. So there's, there's cells that can be influenced to form roots or uh, leaves or whatever. And so you can get a little cube of tissue to create a lot of little plants. Um, so then you, have a, you can have a big, um, large amount of plants, all equal size and everything like that. It makes it a nice crop. Okay. Karen, you have winter growers and you have summer growers. To what extent do you consider that when you're hybridizing? Uh, well, basically, it's just whenever they flower. So for me, it's, it, you know, you can save the pollen and freeze it uh, if you really want to do something that uh, with two different plants that flower in completely different times of year. But otherwise, not much. I mean, for the most part, I just breed hybrid to hybrid now. So they're so mixed up and have so many generations in them that <laughs> they probably don't know, <laughs> know exactly what they are anymore. <laughs> okay, so people have been asking where, where, the, where can they get your hybrids? Do you want to talk a little bit about ISI or? Oh, uh, well, you can always get them through the Huntington. Uh, we do put out a new list every year in the spring, well, closer to early summer now, um, in the journal, as well as on our website. It comes out in May, June. It's the International Succulent Introductions, although it's really not international anymore so much. Um, but you can always email isi at huntington.org and, um, and, or go on our website. Um, you can also do a Google search for um, ISI Huntington, and that'll take you to a link that you can get uh, and look at different years, the different plants that we've had to offer. You can also send us a wish list. Okay. Karen, I understand uh, when you order ISI plants, it, they go beyond just this year. So it's possible to order ISI plants from 2018. Uh, all the way back, well, I I any that we have still for sale. And we have a lot of plants that aren't ISI plants as well. So, um, you know, we've got a pretty good sales section. Um, we're working on hopefully getting a website up, a more general plant sale, given that we can't really have sales, certainly not big sales right now. So we're looking at different ways to um, get the plants out there, make people happy, make us a little room maybe so that we can grow more stuff, uh, all that stuff. Okay. Do uh, the hybrids have uh, susceptibility to owl mites? And do you breed for that? No, um, I don't think they have more susceptibility although I suppose it's possible with all the different teeth and little places for the mites to get in. But I don't really, I mean, there's definitely certain species that seem to be more vulnerable to alamite. Um, we just try to treat everything equally so that it doesn't just those mites <laughs> get killed, hopefully. They're so tiny though, it's, it's really hard to deal with. Um, but we haven't had too much of it lately, thank goodness. Okay, some of you have uh, had some very good questions you put in the chat window here. If you could uh, rewrite those for the, for the Q&A section, that would be really useful. So we don't need to go back and forth between the two. But there's some really good questions in chat. If you want to just resubmit those questions in the Q&A, that would really uh, help everyone. So we only have to watch one screen rather than two here. How did you come up with OIC? <laughs> um, that <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Louise, my coworker, she's she heads up the plant sales. She came up with that one. I had never heard <laughs> that word before. Um, I made sure I asked my British friends to make sure it wasn't too offensive. <laughs> but um, so we kind of describe it as a 
mischievous child rather than you know something worse um but yeah no it's louise's that was her her name <laughs> i just liked it karen somebody asked um how long do you wait to evaluate your hybrid before selecting for production uh probably sometimes too soon maybe but um i try to wait at least a couple of years I, I mean i try to get it to where it's mature uh sometimes i get <coughs> a little excited early although like some they i miss really noticing how good they are or how good they are to me um before you know they've been around for a few years or whatever and then all of a sudden they get my notice so but usually um I, yeah, I tried away at least a couple of years. How long do you leave your seedlings in the plastic bag greenhouse? Uh, well, I don't, if I do it at home, I put them in a Ziploc and I haven't done that for a few years. I once they get start getting their true leaves or whatever, I kind of like to take start to take them out. You might start opening the bag up. You don't want to, them to dampen off or, or to rot. But we've got, I mean, I'm lucky at work. I've got a, a tropical greenhouse that we've got a couple benches on. So I, I just put them in there. They've got a mist system and stuff. So um, yeah, I don't, I don't always do that, but it's definitely a, a good way to do it at home or if you don't have a greenhouse. Karen, someone asked you, what other kind of plants do you hybridize? Um, actually, I have some uh, Manfredo that I crossed with agaves that I'm evaluating right now. It was, uh, so I've got some Mangaves, uh, the Hawarthia hybrid that I have was on ISI a few years ago, a uh, grain of salt. Um, what else? Hmm. Gasterias. I've actually been guilty pleasure. I'd really like to start making some complicated Gasteria hybrids and see what can happen. I have some Gaster aloe hybrids too, but of course they don't, they're not really uh, fertile. So that's kind of a one, one hit wonder. Okay, let's see if we have some more coming in here. Common question always is is about uh, alomites and systemic uh, uh, preventatives for alomite. Ugh. What is what does Huntington do? Um, we have a company that comes and sprays. Um, I think Forbid is one of them that they use. We try to look for new things, um, but yeah, it's a kind of miticide that hopefully can take care of it. It's it's really a difficult thing to um, eradicate and you see it all over the place. I mean, I see it in my neighborhood sometimes and, and people sometimes think, oh, isn't this cool? It's a monstrous inflorescence or a monstrous plant. It's like, uh, no, cut it out, throw it away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, people think it's a really amazing thing and it's like, uh, no. Yeah, so uh, Kelly asked the question, what is aloe saw bones? What is it breed wise? What is in it? Or what is is, oh, so, what is sawbones? A doctor, basically a surgeon kind of thing. So I thought, I, I really wanted to name it uh, for a sawfish because it looks like one of those the little saw thing that it has on the front of its snout, but sawfish just didn't seem like a very good name. So I thought, well, sawbones, that's a, that's a name for a surgeon. Somebody, you know, cuts people up or whatever. He was asking about the parentage. Oh, he was asking about the parentage. Oh, come on. I don't know. It's uh, complicated. <laughs> um, so, I'd have to go back and see what the parents were. I, for, I forget in this moment. Somebody's asking if you could give maybe a one minute tutorial on propagating seeds. Oh, a one minute editor. Uh, it's something real, real quick. Yeah. Like, well, that's kind of what I did in in this talk the early part of the talk was going over the steps that we took to do seed to grow from seed but uh yeah no that would that i would be happy to do that not now though right <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay, uh, let's see. Any more questions, folks? Looks like we're pretty much done with the questions right now. Let's wait for maybe one or two more minutes and see if there are any more questions come in. And uh, let's Somebody was talking about maybe what do you think that, and, and I know it's different, but here's a question. How many, um, what, is the, what is the best way to grow aloes? You know, the shade, temperature, pots and ground, greenhouse. How do you well, uh, there's probably a lot of answers to that, uh, yeah. depending on which aloe, where it's from, where you're from, where you're growing it. Um, right. Shoot, it's, yeah, that's, that's a, a very complicated answer for the most yeah. part. Uh, there's probably a lot of crossover, but um, yeah, probably the first thing is is where you live, when your natural rainfall is and all that stuff. So Joey asks, any successful hybrids of aloe trees? Well, there's several, but why don't you go ahead? Yeah, uh, complicated ones, I, I don't have any yet. I know Kelly and I for years have talked about uh, co-creating something, and I don't know if he's come up with anything yet in his laboratory. Um, but um, thanks, Kelly. Uh, but I'd still like to do it, for sure. Um, I've tried a couple times to get dichotoma in my cross, some of my crosses, and um, I, I, I'm growing them, but I don't know how, whether that actually made it into the cross or if it just kind of made itself. I don't know. So we'll see. We'll see. I'm trying though. Okay. Any, any more questions? Well, I guess that's about that. Does that does it for us? I guess today, uh, Karen. Once once again, thank you for for doing this. It's a wonderful presentation. Uh, I see a lot of great comments. We had a lot of people today. We had over five hundred people. Oh, wonderful! At, which is which is always very nice that uh, that we're doing our job, and that you help us do our job. So uh, thank you. Uh, uh, unless there are any other questions here, we'll call it off for now. We'll see you guys then in two weeks before uh, we sign off here. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Stay safe here. Uh, and, uh, and we'll see you then uh, in two weeks, okay? All right, oh, goodbye, thank you, folks. Guys. Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you, everybody. So good to see everyone. Really good to see everybody. Once yeah. again, thank you, Urban. Thank you, James. And uh, we'll see you in a couple of days, huh? That was great, Karen. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye now. Be safe. You too. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna end everybody. Okay. Ah! <laughs> Don't kill us off. <laughs> we still have 180 people online. 175. So that's. Wow. Okay. All right, Karen, thank you very much. We'll be in touch, thank okay? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Have a great weekend, okay? Yes, bye-bye. Bye.